Thanks for joining us. Appreciate your being here. My name is Bernard Kuzak, and I hold the Smiley Chair in Business Ethics in the Boulder College of Business here at John Carroll. This is our second event in the series Critical Perspectives on AI, and I thank my colleague Simon Fitzpatrick for being willing to work with me across colleges. Simon holds the Shuler Chair in philosophy here at John Carroll. Now thanks to our guest, Frank Pasquale, who is Professor of Law at Cornell Tech and Cornell Law School, to which he moved after positions at Brooklyn Law School, the University of Maryland, and Seton Hall University. Professor Pasquale is an expert on the law of artificial intelligence, algorithms, and machine learning. His widely reviewed books include Black Box Society, the Secret Algorithms that Control Money and Information, published by Harvard University Press in 2015, and New Laws of Robotics, Defending Human Expertise in the Age of AI, published by Harvard in 2020. And I'm a little annoyed with myself. I brought my copies of both those books. They're there in my bag, over in my chair. So this is the second time in a row that I failed to brandish the books of our speaker. Uh, there are books in the back of the auditorium, my back right. There are five copies of each of those two books. So if after the talk you're interested in picking up a copy, uh, they're not free. You can buy a copy uh, and I'll help you with that. Okay, so New Laws of Robotics and The Black Box Society. They're both really excellent books. His work on algorithmic accountability has helped bring the insights and demands of social justice, justice movements to AI law and policy. And he has advised business and government leaders in the healthcare, internet, and finance sectors, including the US Department of Health and Human Services, the US House Judiciary and Energy and Commerce Committees, the Senate Banking Committee, and the Federal Trade Commission. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. One sec. Professor Pasquale will speak for around 40 minutes or so, after which we'll have a response from John Carroll's own Don Winkle, who is the director of our Muldoon Center of Entrepreneurship and holds the call chair of entrepreneurship. I'm grateful to Joan for his time and expertise. I'm really looking forward to a substantive exchange. After Don's response, we'll do Q&A uh, for at least 15 minutes or so. Uh, be brave. So it's your opportunity to ask a question and really think, and that's what we want to do here at John Carroll. So we're creating intellectual community beyond the classroom. This is a real opportunity for you. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> well, thanks so much uh, to Professor Prusak uh, for such a kind introduction. Um, I really appreciate your leadership in bringing together um, values and commerce and the world of the intellectual life. And I really am honored that uh, you've asked me to uh, speak today. And, and to introduce the topic, what I'll be talking about today is um, affective computing, or it could also be called emotional intelligence or artificial emotion, right? Uh, we've got a lot of talk in the news nowadays about, oh yeah, Sorry. Oh, of course. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, 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 now, now the, the microphone's on. I'm used to just having such a booming voice that I don't need a microphone. So there, there we go. So this is the topic today is on basically moving from artificial intelligence to artificial emotion, right? And we've got a lot of dialogue in society today where we're thinking about what does it mean for machines to take on human tasks? Right? What does it mean for a machine to be a teacher, a journalist, a doctor, you know, all these different areas? Well, I'm going to look at this problem from a slightly different perspective, and I'm going to move us out of the realm of jobs and work, to some extent, and into the realm of friendship and relationships in this talk. Right? I think it's going to be really interesting to think about, you know, do we have the potential for artificial companions, artificial emotional responses from machines, or if we do accept that, what are the implications, right? So that's gonna be some of the outline of the talk today. Um, in thinking about what affective computing is, we've got some good definitions up here, right? Essentially, the way that I would think about artificial 
emotion or affect of computing, the computation of affect, is first, it's about trying to read how people feel, right? Every day we do this, you know, we try to get a sense of what are people feeling about us? Do they like what we're saying? Do they not like what we're saying? Are they skeptical? Are they receptive, etc.? And so the dream of this artificial emotion research is to get computers that can do the same, right? To get, say, an ATM. If you come up to the ATM for your bank, it would know, are you happy today or not? That your car, you get into your car, and the car knows, like, is he agitated? Should I offer soothing music? Or maybe something, you know, is he more uh, upbeat? Maybe I should offer something a little more peppy? Those sorts of things, right? So these are some relatively innocent applications of affective computing. There's also ways in which it can try to stimulate emotion, right? So there's sort of an effort to both read people to simulate emotion, right? Maybe to mirror people's emotion and to stimulate certain emotions in persons. So this is the main ideas behind affective computing. And we're gonna see basically, it's going to be slowly adopted, but I think more and more quickly in healthcare, education, and policing. And it's going to increasingly judge and try to manipulate us, okay? But I want to give one initial disclaimer. This talk only addresses non-therapeutic affective computing. Okay? Where this field started, it's kind of interesting where it started, was with some psychologists, including Simon Baron Cohen, that were interested in, training, interested in training autistic children how to read emotions of non-autistic persons. Right? So this is what inspired a lot of researchers in psychology to try to figure out, say, emotion wheels of all the different types of emotions. I think one of Baron Cohen's uh, research efforts resulted in an emotion wheel of like 432 different emotions, right? Um, Facebook now has boiled it down to six for us with emotion reaction buttons, so. <laughs> We've gotten a little more efficient maybe, but, or maybe not. Um, and so this I think is really interesting to think about. I, and I think that could be a terrific thing, you know, and, and it already has been a terrific thing for many autistic children and others. But what we're seeing is that it's basically, it's moving out from the therapeutic context to other non-therapeutic contexts. And that's what I think is really interesting to discuss and potentially critique, okay? So what are the tools of affective computing? Well, here's our, our Facebook reaction buttons, right? Um, there are categorization of emotion and a lot of times quantification of emotion. And this quantification can be really specific. Like for example, at one point, Facebook would give a post five times more exposure to the extent it had angry faces than the other faces. It sort of knew that like, getting people angry would make them more engaged, right? So that's one way that you could sort of like, decide what content to put out there. And a lot of it too is about trying to binarize it, right? So on one level, it's kind of interesting to think like at first on Facebook or other places, you know, in other places now, you can only like, like or not like, right? On Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, you either like it or you don't like it, right? Facebook then said, we want more information. We'll give you these six options. But ultimately, it's all going to probably boil down to some sort of score about how uh, high they should rank a post or something like that. So these are the basic tools, right? These are the basic tools that you're going to use for affective computing. Um, and if you think about it sort of in, in the business world, there's lots of applications in business, right? Because to the extent that you can get a machine that's actually going to be uh, developing loyalty, trust among individuals, that may bring certain benefits, right? Certain profits, certain brand loyalty to individuals, to the business that can do that, right? And if we think about in your marketing classes and other sorts of areas of, uh, if you, if you take, take marketing, there's a lot of been an emphasis on this forever, you know, well before it became affective computing. There were folks that were thinking deeply about how do we create these types of emotional attachments between persons and companies, persons and products, et cetera. Right, give people sort of a warm feeling in their heart when they drink Coca-Cola or something like that. Right, and this is what uh, Richard Yonk is sort of looking at in this Heart of the Machine book, is to develop this type of loyalty, even putting in quotes, love um, from customers. But we can think about how appropriate love might be in these scenarios in, in a little bit. Now, I want to, and, and, and I, I promise you, I won't have too many totally texty slides, but I think it's good to start with like some initial level setting as to what we're talking about. Right. Because a lot of times, I mean, probably we, we don't really think that deeply about like what is an emotion, right? Even in a therapeutic context, even like a context of therapy or something like that, people are rarely asked to think like, what does it mean to say, you know, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm happy, et cetera, right? 
Well, this gives us some sense. This definition, I think, is somewhat so, so, uh, helpful. Saying it's a mental state accompanied by physiological and autonomic nervous system changes, subjective feelings and action tendencies, right? Why do I put this up here? I put it up here because I think that when we think about systematically using huge amounts of data to manipulate someone, right, to stimulate stash manipulate someone, that's always gonna raise really important ethical issues when it comes into something as intimate as this, right? As intimate as physiological and autonomic nervous system responses, right? That's why I wanna sort of bring the stakes up a little bit. And I'm gonna give you lots of concrete examples of where this could be problematic, where we'd wanna really think this through before we initiated it. Um, but I just wanted to get that out here. Um, one other thing to think about is affect versus emotion. This is getting a little into the weeds, but I just wanted to note that, you know, affect could be things like moods, um, reflex actions, autonomic responses, mirror reflexes, etc. And emotions are a special case of affect because they're intentional. They take an object and, re and represent a relationship. So your mood, you know, could be something that you just sort of feel down in the day, right? And it could be something where you could feel up, you know, more energetic. It could just be sort of free floating. Whereas an emotion is often gonna be something that's a little more specific, a little more directed. Okay, so that's gonna be you know, getting our, our level setting on these different types of you know, feelings in, in the brain or uh, for ourselves. So how does affective computing deal with this, right? We've had psychology for decades, if not centuries. We've had psychological studies. What happens when you bring in computer scientists to think about psychology? One way you can think about it is the way of Marvin Minsky, right? And he says things like, you know, how does imagination work? What are the causes of consciousness? What are emotions? Well, we know what forces, stress, and strains are. We've had incredible uh, um, uh, progress in understanding solids, liquids, and gases. So why can't we do the same with emotion, right? If we could compress a gas to twice its density, why can't we make people twice as happy, right? <laughs> or if we can sort of do certain things to understand how liquids will flow if you put them down on a certain surface, why can't we try to figure out how will people feel if we put certain things in front of them, okay? So that can again be the sort of thing, and I think this is really important because what's going on here is what I'd call a naturalization, right, of human sciences. It's an effort to look at humans the way we've looked at rocks and stones and animals and plants and sort of like aspects of the natural world, which can sometimes be really important, right? I mean, certainly that's the natural sciences of the foundation of medical sciences. But I think when we move into these mental realms, we also have to be a little, a little more careful, okay? I want to also note that, of course, there's lots of other ways about thinking about emotions, okay? And I'll just focus on one book here. All of these offer very different ways of thinking of emotions, but, but basically Martha Nussbaum is a, a wonderful philosopher at the University of Chicago. And she's talked about how she thinks of emotions as not necessarily being sort of just natural aspects of our experience, but as always involving thoughts and values, right? And this is what's really interesting about emotions, right? On the one hand, they're kind of this a way in which we feel about something, and that can be really important to us, but we also, as thinking beings, can always step back from our emotions and think, how should we feel about how we feel, right? And this, I think, is what's really troubling in some of the affective computing I'm gonna get into, is that it kind of wants to skip that step and make somebody feel a certain way without encouraging certain reflection on the feeling it's, it's uh, uh, sort of promoting. Well, how might that work? Okay. Well, one is, you know, we can imagine, and this is one example of affective computing in the wild, right? This is a Microsoft classification of how someone feels, right? And these are, Relatively easy to say if we've got eight feelings. Remember, note that you know, from Facebook we had six different reactions. Here we've moved on to eight different types of feelings. This is relatively easy to classify as surprise, right? There's not much of the other, maybe a little bit of neutral, <laughs> a tiny amount uh, if you've got really good eyesight, but that's really where they're going with this particular uh, classification. So sometimes it's just not gonna matter that much how you classify people. But we're gonna see in other scenarios, it might really matter a lot, okay? It might be very important in terms of how, how they were classified. So here's the opposite of the spectrum, right? You can imagine these sorts of things being used in, say, supermarkets, Family Dollar, other stores, 
where they don't want to have many staff. Okay? And they may have eventually in the near future, far future, places where you just check out yourself. Like I think some of the Amazon stores uh, for Whole Foods, others, they're experimenting with something where you don't even check out, you just sort of like walk out, you know, and they sort of know your, your account from your face. They facially recognize your face. But there's something in between that, which could be something like this type of self-checkout, which I'm sure everybody's seen, right? And imagine if you have someone who seems like they're agitated. Well, cameras like this are eventually going to be classifying people as either being agitated enough where you'd call the police versus where you'd call an assistant manager, right? That is sort of the dream of, of a lot of affective computing, to be classified in this way. Um, we're also going to get into examples in the classrooms, uh, classrooms for elementary schools, where certain yell, shout, screams can be reported to disciplinary personnel who could take someone into the behavioral modification center. You know, um, that's what they called it when I was in high school. Sort of an odd, uh, quite a term um, uh, to be to be uh, uh, worked with, or could be part of the school to prison pipeline, right? So this, I think, really shows the stakes. It's not all just about trying to figure out who's surprised and who's not. There are ways in which affect feeds into how you treat somebody, right? So moving on to the business side of things, right? I want to be sure that we think about the business ethics of implementing this stuff before I get into how I would propose to regulate it. You know, because as a, as a lawyer, I'm always thinking about how to regulate things. And I think as a, someone in business, you may also want to think a lot about how will things be regulated and how you might uh, uh, use that either to your advantage or, uh, or it might be a, a disadvantage. So we see in uh, the realm of advertising and marketing this idea of love marks, brand love, right? And so these are, think, I think, are both very positive ideals of developing emotional relationships between companies and people, right? You can sort of think about this as a way in which you can sort of develop these relationships, but on the other side, I think on the far side, and this more negative side, are things like what casino designers have used for a long time, which has been trying to addict people to their services, right? And this fine line between, say, having people really like what they get from a business versus being addicted is a really interesting one, you know? I've heard some of the uh, uh, representatives, uh, senators, et cetera, saying recently, uh, analogizing some online services to digital fentanyl, you know? That's going way too far. But, but there are ways in which these services can go too far in their aspirations. And one thing that's so interesting about Natasha Dashiell's book is she shows in this Addiction by Design book that a lot of folks in Silicon Valley went to Las Vegas to learn from the slot machine designers about how to design apps to get people addicted to the app or using it more and more and more, right? Three hours a day, four hours a day, five hours a day, paying for in-app purchases, et cetera, right? And this is a very interesting sort of issue to consider is that type of play upon people's neural states, right? And how far can that go before we might say, hmm, there ought to be some sort of intervention here, right? Note that even some of the companies involved now have things like nighttime mode, rest mode, right? We see that with like Instagram, sometimes they'll say it's 10 o'clock, time to shut down, right? And so they're starting to take this on, and Tristan Harris is a, is a great uh, developer who sort of uh, developed some ideas about, called uh, Time Well Spent is his firm that sort of promotes these ideas, or his, uh, his nonprofit that promotes these ideas. But we've got to think about them, I think, uh, more deeply. I'd also note that, you know, we have things marketed now of chatbot lovers. So for example, the company, the Chinese firm Xiaolai, has markets these companions, and has actually, I think, about eight million virtual girlfriends and boyfriends that are now in use, okay? So, it, and on one level, we have to think from a business perspective, is it ethical to offer these types of things as services, right? Uh, there's a firm called Replica, which is, also offers the same things. I think that's a European firm. And so you have to wonder, and you have lots of people that are in what they consider to be virtual relationships online with someone they call their chatbot lover, right? Um, we also see it a bit in dark patterns. So if you note here, there's neural research, research on how to affect people's emotion that might say, let's try to make sure, or just how people perceive things, say, let's hide the thing we don't want them to do. So probably people often want to opt out of everything when they're dealing with websites, but no, it's here, right? In light gray, you can barely see it. But you can 
but they will give you many options that are clear are opt in, don't opt out, don't not opt in, right? <laughs> so, so this is another way in which, you know, sort of manipulative things online. And we've gotten to the point too where there are, due to uh, deep fakes, there are photorealistic depictions of persons. So this is just a still, but these anchors were part of a media operation that was just fake people presenting the news, right? And you might say, well, it's just like a cartoon, but now it's real people. We can't tell if they're real people or not. I mean, I've gotten that. And actually, a lot of the legal discourse on this says, what's the big deal? It's just like a more and more realistic cartoon. And now it's just, it's indistinguishable. But I think it is a big deal. Because when you have a real person saying something, they're putting their reputation on the line, right? If you see a, a TV show at night, and someone actually is, is giving you the news, if they feed you lies or propaganda, you can later call them out on it and say, look, this person, don't trust them anymore. These are just one of a million, a thousand, a million, a billion possible depictions of human persons that are fake, right? So if, for example, one of these news anchors who doesn't exist tells lies, well, then they just decompose them and they just make a new one for the next week or something. Right? This, I think, is really pr troubling. And I think that comes up as well with virtual influencers. And I think the reason why we're seeing this type of deep fake and photorealistic faking of persons is in order to create online personalities that have no responsibility. Right? And that, I think, is a problem because I think if you think about the importance of human faces to concern, a human face has a certain claim on us that text or audio often doesn't. And that, I think, is why it deserves some further attention. Um, here also are virtual friends. So I talked earlier about from brand love to virtual, uh, to, to vir virtual lovers, et cetera, from Shall I. This is from the company Replica of virtual friends. And people, there, there are long accounts online of people chatting with their virtual friend for the companionship of it, right? But is this real companionship or just a simulation of it? I think that there's something profoundly potentially deceptive or self-deceptive about these types of online encounters that really needs to be addressed and disclosed from the get-go and probably throughout the encounter, right? I'd also say that like, the reason why these virtual friends are being marketed is not necessarily to help persons, although I think maybe the, the per those behind the firms think that they are relieving loneliness. But I call a virtual friend a probe because it's yet another way to find out things about a person ultimately for marketing purposes, right? So you sort of are probing and you ask them questions like, what's your favorite uh, food to eat? What's your favorite music? What's your favorite like, vacation destination? You know, don't be surprised if within a few weeks you sort of see ads for that, et cetera. Now, of course, maybe that all seems pretty harmless, but I still think it's hard to justify if people don't really understand it as being, that being such a key part of it, because a real friend isn't really doing that for those purposes, right? It's, it's not really doing that, whereas a, 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 this sort of virtual friends are. Um, I, I draw on a book called The Simulation of Surveillance to give a sense of where all this is leading us. And I think it's all leading us toward illusions, right? Toward illusions via affect. And I think the problem is that there's this real gap between, they want to get rid of the gap between um, uh, uh, illusion and reality, right? And I think that's a problem, right? And it almost sort of makes it hard to even have a distinction between knowing what we're dealing with online if we're dealing with affective computing that's trying to mirror back to us what it thinks we want. Which I think, again, is another uh, sort of hall of mirrors problem here. And, you know, this, again, these are the uh, replica, versions of replica that are on offer, you know, that will say things like, how are you doing today? What are you up to today? Et cetera. And I think that they are simulating affect, but without the real cost involved in offering real concern for somebody. So, and then finally, the movie Her, I highly recommend. I, I know probably not many people have seen it, but the, the, the ultimate endpoint of some of this stuff is sort of portrayed in the movie 
where someone just sort of brings his phone with him as his date to a picnic, right? You know, you might sort of say, well, this is the, uh, care, the person I care most about. Well, moving on from this, you know, I think that like what's kind of funny is that, you know, you see a lot of times in science fiction, we're warned about these things, but the, uh, those behind technology firms just make them anyway, right? So they, they consider the thing that you're warned about in a movie like hers, don't create a virtual companion, I think. I think that's the message of the movie. But a lot of tech firms are like, yeah, that sounds really cool, let's make it. You know? And so I think we need to question that, we need to question that sort of uh, thing. Now, why do I think there's a problem with affective computing? Okay, I've given you lots of examples, and I want to sort of dig deeper into a theory of why there's a problem, right? Because, I mean, anybody could just stand up here and say, I don't like this, I don't like that, don't like this, you know, et cetera. Maybe I'm just a conservative fuddy-duddy, you know. But the reason I don't like this stuff is because I think it has a potential both for reading and write, writing emotion, or reading or stimulating emotion, is another way of putting it, that either doesn't work or works too well. And in either of these categories, it causes problems. So if it doesn't work at reading emotion, it causes misrecognition. I'll show you the concrete examples of that. If it doesn't work at stimulating emotion or writing it, it causes alienation. If it works too well at reading your emotion, it's a privacy invasion, right? Imagine if I brought a little robot in today and could sort of read the minds of everybody here, or like do they like it or not, et cetera. Well, it's not that big a deal here, but imagine if it was like someone who had a position of responsibility, you know, it'd be more troubling then. And finally, if it's too good at writing emotion or making people feel a certain way, there's a modulation fear, like it's controlling people too much. If you've seen the movie Megan, the doll in Megan has this sort of modulation relationship with the, with the little girl. You know, it sort of has this sort of a very powerful effect on the person that's supposed to serve. And I think it's a problem. But I'll get into each of these, all four. Okay. So first, faulty reading of emotion. This is the misrecognition side of things, right? So misrecognition essentially is a problem of not being able to trust AI emotion recognition because the diversity of expressions on people's faces is too great for it to handle, okay? And this can be cultural diversity, it can be people in different cultures, in different parts of the country, in different areas of a city, et cetera, emote in very different ways, and they may not be in the data set. Or there are ways in which even someone in the course of their lives might just act in certain different ways. And the computer often does not know the background information necessary to truly understand what's going on in their life, what they're really thinking. Okay. Um, this is a, a study, and by the way, this is an example of visualization of how it works, emotion recognition or facial recognition, emotion recognition, all work on similar technology where you, know, you still might measure how far apart are the lids on someone's eyes. Are the, is the, this tip of the lip three millimeters closer to the nose than it usually is, et cetera, right? That's how the actual computing is working, right? It's sort of making these, dividing up everybody's faces into all these different zones and then saying, well, okay, he, you know, moved up both, he's smiling, he's happy, right? You know, that sort of a thing. And so what uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett and others have demonstrated is that since instances of the same emotion category are neither reliably expressed through nor perceived from a common set of facial movements, the communicative capacities of the face are limited, and that's often what it's based on. Now, what we could do then is we could say, well, to help affective computing, we should all wear an Apple Watch too, and have it also measure our galvanic skin response and heart rate. But then we're getting closer to the privacy problems, right? <laughs> so I don't know if we want to go that far just to help out affective computing, but that's one thing that's been proposed, okay? Um, I also note that, you know, if you think about affective computing for teachers and employers, this is something already being detected, as I mentioned earlier, in schools. It's also something you might al already have experienced in applying for jobs. Right? So if you use software to apply for a job, and for example, some AI firms have people do a three-minute interview on the phone. So you'll get a company like HireVue, I won't say that they're doing exactly this now, but there's companies like HireVue or in this field. You get your cell phone, you look into it, you have to record a video and it has someone, sometimes even an avatar, says, please describe a stressful experience you had at work. And you've got to respond to that. And how your response is being graded is not just what words are you saying, although there will be a transcript provided to the corporation that will be parsed via natural language processing. It's also going to be looking at how do you feel, right? Are you happy enough? Are you emoting correctly? 
right? Because for the stressful experience, you might think in general I should be happy for the job interview, but describing the stressful experience, you should probably should be a little more serious, but maybe not too serious because you don't want to seem too depressing, right? I think that's what might have happened to Katie Britt in her response to the State of the Union address a few nights ago. But anyway, um, if anyone saw that speech. But, but I think this sort of problem, right, is it's a problem that you're, you, when your emotion is being graded as part of the application process, it does become something that I think is pretty high stakes. And what's different about it is that if you're interviewing with a person, that person is constantly sort of sending you signals back and forth as to like, are they interested or not? Are they getting what you're saying or not, et cetera? These avatars can't do that. That's one other reason, by the way, why Zoom can often be so fatiguing, right? There's a great article called The Theory of Zoom Fatigue. And part of it is that it's just, there's so much more information communicated in an in-person, sort of person-to-person -person uh, uh, situation than there is in the situation of like flat screens. And that is even more than what's being communicated in the case of these avatars asking questions for HR interviews. Um, I'd also note that there are real concerns about bias, right? Um, a lot of these data sets are uh, just not ready for prime time. Lauren Rue is a researcher that's exposed racial bias um, in these situations, right? And so that's a real problem, right? If we have data sets that have these types of biases, I've written an article in the Columbia Law Review about trying to correct data sets for biases like this. Um, but I think it's, it's an ongoing problem. It's gonna take a long time to correct for. Um, I'd also note that you know, the question is, do we end it or mend it, right? There's a lot of people trying to mend affective computing now by, for example, dealing with those discrimination problems. But part of what I have to wonder when I look through these different uh, scenarios is, is the game worth the candle, right? Do you want to have all these scenarios where we're trying to record and attribute to people their feelings? Um, there, was a, there were two schools in China that uh, a few years ago implemented something from companies called Han Wang and Hick Vision. And what these companies did is one of them would take a picture of every student every minute, their faces, and another would take a picture every second. And they would score each picture of the face for a relative engagement of the students. Then they would rank the students in the class from most engaged to least engaged, and then rank the teachers in the school by which had the classes that were most engaged to least engaged, right? And, and this is something where, again, that sort of attribution, I think, is something that, uh, even, even within China, which is sort of relatively reconciled to a lot of top-down surveillance, there was action against that. There was actually a hashtag on Weibo, the Chinese social network, uh, that said, uh, hashtag, thank God I graduated already. So I don't have to deal with this. Right? And I think that that's, we're gonna be facing more and more pressure in a data-driven world for those types of really invasive looks into, or attempts to look into people's psyches. And I say attempts to look into because I think a lot of times it doesn't work. I don't think it is actually reading how people are feeling. I think it rather what it's doing is it's giving a certain people that run the effect of computing the power to attribute mental states to others. And often those others have no idea it's happening or have no way of really um, uh, contesting what's going on or saying, oh, actually I was engaged. I may have had my head down, but I was actually listening, et cetera. So moving on, let's go into privacy invasion. So I critique what happens if it doesn't work, right? What if it works really well? What if we get to a world where, you know, you routinely go by machines that say, wow, you look like you're feeling sad today. You know, you're like, my goodness, I really am feeling sad today. That machine, amazing, it knows me, okay? If we are in that world, it becomes somewhat of a frightening world, I think. Because as Jennifer Bard has asked, you know, what if it's sort of reading thoughts? You know, I mean, emotion, I mentioned, remember earlier in the talk, I mentioned, these two different theories of emotion. One being, emotion just like happens to you. It's like a natural process. It's like being pushed by the wind. It's like I'm angry. It's like something, a natural thing happening to me. But Martha Nussbaum's theory of emotion is that it's thought, right? It's an upheaval of thought crafted into a certain form by our self-reflection on what the emotion means, okay? And especially uh, being at a Jesuit institution, I really want to emphasize this because it's one of the, 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 the Jesuits are masters of this type of reflection, at sort of contemplative retreats, other sort of things like that. They really, uh, going back to Ignatius Loyola, were experts in psychology, okay? And especially in the sort of like melding of thought, virtue, values, and uh, emotion. And so if you do think of emotion, I think in this more complex philosophical way, right? Um, then 
you have to worry about the emotion machine reading your emotions because it's really reading your thoughts and do you really want your thoughts read? Um, you know, and there's a lot of even Supreme Court jurisprudence on the importance of the privacy of thought. Neil Richards has another book called Intellectual Privacy. And in the limit case, it's like mental health diagnoses without a license, right? Um, in 1964, when Barry Goldwater was running for president, there was actually a group of psychologists and these psychologists said, he is too crazy to be president, okay? He's insane, do not elect him. Well, he later sued for libel and won. But on top of that, the American Psychological Association said, psychologists should not pass judgment on the sanity of public figures if they haven't had a therapeutic relationship with them, right? And what I worry about is if we have a world of affective computing, we're essentially setting up computers to be like the psychologist in the 1964 election, saying that person is you know, mentally unstable, that person is totally fine, et cetera. I don't know if we want to do that. Um, moving forward, you know, what about when it fails, right? at writing emotion, right? So now what I've dealt with in one and two, just to, just to review the bidding, one was when it fails, when it misrecognizes emotion. Two is when it works too well at recognizing emotion. Now we're back to failure at stimulating or writing emotion, right? At stimulating, sort of making people feel a certain way. Well, that's the problem of alienation, right? And, and alienation, I think, is a really interesting problem that you know, a lot of roboticists think a lot about um, because there's so many efforts to make robots that evoke human feelings. But what's weird about them is that the closer they get to humanity, often the more people find them kind of scary or alienating. Okay? So I think that's a, that's a real issue. Um, and just to give examples of this, you know, going up to uh, the robots in Star Wars, you know, there's sort of a, a positive feeling about them as they become, they're a little more human, uh, but they're not totally you know, like trying to mimic humans. Um, in movies, for example, like Megan, I think one reason why this doll in the movie is so scary is because she's so close to being human, but it's like uncanny, but she's not. And that sort of is why you're sort of like scared by her. Um, there's another movie um, called I'm Your Man. It's a German film, really smart film about AI and relationships and, 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 and emotions, where they, they portray what it would mean for a, a robot to get out of this uncanny valley and to be very much like a human and to be adored, basically. Um, but even that movie sort of says it's hard to get out of the uncanny valley and maybe we don't want to, right? Maybe we don't want to basically have an emotional reaction that is like super high as human likeness becomes almost perfect, almost perfect simulation of humanity. Um, why is this so hard? I think it's hard because alienation happens because evoking precise emotional responses is difficult. Again, if we think about the response to the State of the Union address, um, or if we think about you know, TikToks where people are making fun of other TikToks because they feel like the person's been too dramatic, like this TikTok, you know, all of those are situations where it's just hard to figure out what the emotional response should be. And if we as humans are bad about it, at it, computers are often even worse. Okay, so to move on, one other example here is um, what happens though if it gets too good at stimulating emotion? And that's what I classify as modulation, okay? So modulation is a situation where essentially it's too good at sort of either recognizing emotion in people or making people, and then making people feel a certain way. And here again, I'm, I'm getting a little abstract. Um, I apologize, but I think these, these authors are very smart and worth reading. Um, and the problem often that I think is, is really the big worry I have about a lot of political advertising is the concept of alexithymia, which means no words for feelings, right? There's lots of alexithymic people out there. Lots of people who have a bad feeling often, but they can't really pin it on anything. And when you have really good advertising, really sort of affective computing that can use crunch numbers and figure out how to make certain people feel or who can sort of figure out they have a certain underlying mental state that can be manipulated in a certain direction, that's scary. Right. I think some of the worst demagogues in human history are those that had this terrifying gift of recognizing certain levels of emotional states in people that were in coets like the alexithymic and who were then able to craft them toward certain very bad ends. And that I think we've got to worry a lot about with respect to affective computing and political campaigns and, and some other sensitive areas. I'd also note that you know you might worry that essentially if you have affective computing that's always measuring like how deferential you are, 
for example, at airports, customs, other things like that, we may have a worry that people might be sort of made to be very, very obedient and sort of suspect if they ever fail in their deference. So that's another modulation concern you could have about affective computing. Um, so I think that, you know, the question ultimately is, are we, when we look at affective computing, relating to or obeying the machine, right? The author who's done the most to promote affective computing is Rana al Kaliubi, who in her book De Girl Decoded says it's all about making machines that we can relate to, right? But my worry is that we don't necessarily, in the process of trying to relate to the machines, we may instead be in a position of sort of deferring to them too much. And that's where I think we need to be careful. You know, I mean, this one way of patenting modulation is to make people jump up, for example, to end the commercial. Um, perhaps we'll have to have certain emotional states or emotional states recognized by a machine in order to go forward in the process, for example, to be hired. And that, again, is something that's worth sort of uh, evaluating from an ethical standpoint before it's adopted. Um, and, you know, example, the example of Zoom engagement scores is another one, right? Imagine being given a score for how engaged you are on an online meeting. That's another sort of big problem that I think would, would not be wise because of this modulation problem. So you might wonder, you know, why can't we find happy mediums between all these things, right? Why can't we find a happy medium between misrecognition and privacy invasion, between alienation and modulation? I'm gonna, as I know I'm running out of time, I'm just gonna be very quick with this. <laughs> and so we can talk about it in questions uh, if you'd like. But I'm gonna say I think this is because a lot of affective computing is a gimmick, okay? I think a lot of affective computing is something that like, it is gimmicky and it is something where we should not be sort of like lured into thinking the machine knows us too well. And we shouldn't be forced into situations where the, we have to act in certain ways to get past the machine, okay? That's my, and I, and I base this on Nye's theory of the gimmick. Um, um, she's an excellent writer about sort of gimmicky aspects of all sorts of modern life, including technology. I think we have to worry about this stuff and say, and, and be skeptical about it. That's, I think, a first step to wisdom about it, is to be skeptical about its value, its use, um, and how far it should go. So my concluding thoughts are that essentially, this is, AI hype is a major problem. Okay? And I, I think that, you know, we have to, to stop the affective computing research program going too far toward privacy invasion, modulating people, et cetera. We have to really think about how well can we evaluate its positive purposes and how well can we separate those out from things that make us uncomfortable or that could possibly put us in disadvantageous situations. Um, these three books, I think, develop this issue, the, these ideas more. I mean, it's why it's awkward intelligence, artificial unintelligence, or, or my book on robotics. All of us, I mean, I would put us all in the same camp as trying to question, is this real intelligence or is it an application of power, right? Is it an application of power in terms of attributing emotions to people or making them feel certain ways in order to get something out of them? And as we look at that, my final challenge to you would be that we have to interrogate these emotion machines or they're going to endlessly interrogate us. If we don't interpolate meanings, essentially casting certain identities on us, okay? If we don't take a critical stance, if we don't try to make sure that we are understanding exactly how they're working, where they're working, what they're doing to people, then we're going to be increasingly subject to them and I think that would not be a great place to be. So with that, that's it for me. Um, oops, no appendix. That's just the end. <laughs> so that's it. Thanks so much. <laughs> so as uh, Bernard said, my name is Don Winkle. I lead the entrepreneurship program here. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, and I look at things similarly, but in other ways very differently. So I'm going to assume that Frank is maybe more uh, attuned to thinking first and acting second. I'm the opposite, right? I <laughs> lead and then think. Uh, and so this was fascinating to me, um, and thank you to Bernard for asking me to participate in this, because a lot of this stuff was really new to me. Once I started digging into it, I thought, okay, I guess subconsciously I knew what was going on and I knew some of this stuff was happening, but I hadn't really thought much about it. Um, and so it was really challenging to me in a, in a good way to dive into this and try to think about this and understand it. And so, what I came to was that I'm sort of scaredly fascinated by it. 
Uh, I echo a lot of what um, Frank said in terms of some of the concerns, but I also think that there's a lot of opportunity for empowerment here. Obviously, and everything I say here is, has, has this sort of caveat of if it's done in an ethical way, in a thoughtful way, those kind of things, right? So um, the, the scared part of me says when we're dealing with this stuff and when we're thinking about it, the people who are developing it, the people who are using it, need to prioritize some things, I think. They need to prioritize the privacy piece. They need to prioritize that well-being piece. Right? Because if we're interacting with this kind of stuff, businesses are using this kind of stuff to manipulate things, um, it can be pretty damaging, potentially, to uh, human beings' well-being. Right? Um, the human agency piece, like how, how much control do I have, actually, that line might get blurred, depending on where we go. Um, and then obviously, with any of this stuff, the idea of continuous improvement, so that we can increase the precision, and we, or improve the precision and improve the reliability. I don't know if any of this stuff's possible. I'm not a tech guy. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes or technologically. Um, but in terms of using it and thinking about ways it could be used, these are these are the kind of things I came to from an outsider's perspective and said, look, this stuff is here. It's probably not going to go away. Uh, so what could we possibly do to try to turn it into the best, most useful, safest thing? Right? But it's also seems to me that it's a very, very slippery slope um, when we come to this. One. I think uh, that there needs to be a lot of public dialogue around this, and you know I appreciate uh, Bernard having this and, and everything that Frank does in terms of talking about this and sharing about it and getting people to think about it. I think that's super important. Um, I think it, there needs to be a very, very intense scrutiny of this, to a lot of your Frank's points, where we really have to think about this thing, we really have to use this stuff, to figure out where is it working, where is it not, and what does working and success mean when it comes to this, and then some kind of regulation. Uh, I don't know how that's possible or what that might look like, but I think those kind of things need to be thought out really, really well by really, really smart people um, that, that maybe don't have as much of a business agenda behind it. Um, so one of the ways I tend to do things is that when I approach uh, sort of new topics, new tools, and all that is to think about, OK, how does it benefit me? So I can be a little, uh, a little selfish at times. But so I started. Thinking about with all of these tools and this technology and all these things out there, what could what could be ways that it benefits me? And I, I took it a guess that there would be a lot of students here tonight. And so, trying to put myself in the position of a student, right? One of these days, hopefully not too soon or not too too much later than this, you're going to be in the workplace and you're going to move yourself into positions of leadership where you're going to be having making decisions. You're going to be you're going to have a lot of power and influence, right? And so some of these things I wanted to talk about are, these might be ways where you start to encounter these kind of things, and what might you be able to do with it, and how might it be able to benefit you. Right? Um, so I think some of this, it's, it, it, it can, and, and a lot of this comes um, from the perspective of like training. Right? So think about it in terms of, can we use these things as a little bit of a training kind of tool in a business setting? Right? So maybe, if those kind of early caveats are, are, are thought through, maybe it can make us, as people, more effective at understanding and responding to human emotional states. Right? Um, so in a business, there's a lot of scenarios where in an <laughs> HR context right, or a managerial context when you have to deal with employees, you need to be able to understand where those people are, right? what, what they're feeling at the moment, that kind of thing. And so some of us may, may not be good at that. Right? Uh, my wife and I always argue, uh, as a lot of people do after 20 years of marriage, uh, about various levels of intelligence and who's better and who's worse. Uh, and while I think uh, I'm better and she thinks she's better, um, way back when we took an emotional intelligence test. And she scored in the 99th percentile, and I scored in maybe like the 3rd percentile. Okay? Uh, so I'm not very good at this. Right? And so I started thinking, and I thought, man, that would be cool if there was some kind of tools or system or something that would help me hone my skills of sort of increasing some of my emotional intelligence or being better at reading. It's going to benefit me. It's going to benefit the people that I'm interacting with. Right? Now, there's problems about the accuracy and all of those kind of things, but it would be really cool if that could happen. Right? 
Another situation, personally, right, I'm a parent. A lot of you in here are parents, or maybe someday will be. And same sort of situation, right? The better I can be at reading this little thing's emotions, the better I'm going to be as a parent. The more, the more successfully I'm going to be able to serve their needs and hopefully create a better connection between us and the trust develops and so on and so forth, right? So it'd just be kind of me if there was something like this that could train me. My wife tried to train me, and that doesn't work very well, right? Uh, for her or for I, or for our son. So it'd be kind of me if that happened. Um, I think some of this stuff, if, if it can come to fruition and, and there can be some responsible use of it, can all, almost uh, sort of enhance this human connection that we have. Because we're talking about these sort of emotional levels, right? So it can give us these insights into some of our emotional states, and it can help us navigate what, what we all get into a lot of times, which are very complex social interactions, right? Now, from a business standpoint, there can be a downside to it or a darker side to it because I would argue that when we, uh, as consumers, make buying decisions, we are making almost purely emotional decisions. We use rational thought and logic to justify those decisions but they're almost always going to be an emotionally driven decision. And so, to some of what Frank was talking about, these businesses can start to use that information and manipulate it, right? So there's also this kind of dark side to it. Um, because I think it, it can sort of foster some greater empathy and, and uh, in certain kind of contexts, right? And so, from like, think about a, a customer service situation, right? If people are calling in and they're wanting to get help with a product or whatever reason they're calling in. If there are other people on the other end of the line who can more accurately and more quickly and better identify the kind of emotional uh, experience that person is having, the customer might have a better interaction, have a better relationship with the company, and then everybody sort of wins. Right? Um, or another one, the other kind of things are like conflict management, right? When, when things get overwhelming at work, uh, when people are really stressed at work, when people are negotiating. So all of these sort of human-to-human -human interactions, I think there's a potential here, if things you know, are, are really thought through and worked out, there's a potential here to increase our capabilities and increase success, whatever that may mean in this specific context, using some of this, this uh, technology and tools. I think it empowers us. Um, interventions, I think it's a big one, and I won't go too deep into it because I don't have any clue on this, but um, you know, a lot of, of sort of mental health scenarios I could see where this could certainly be damaging, right? but I could see it might also be really, really helpful. Um, I grew up and I spent a lot of time struggling with a lot of mental health issues when I was younger, and I wasn't very good at expressing that, at, at sharing what I was feeling. I don't know that big word you shared, but I think that's me. Um, and other, so the other people, right, who were trying to help me, who was asking to help me, didn't really do that great of a job because I wasn't giving them what they needed, right? And so maybe something here helps me to understand myself better, to be able to better express myself, and helps that person to better be able to understand what I'm doing and feeling and going through so they can better help, right? Again, there's a dark side of that that, that makes it play. Um, the buyer behavior, like I mentioned, right, businesses, uh, want to appeal to your emotions because that's how you're going to decide to buy the product or use their service or not, uh, and, and the rest of it there. So, you know, I think, you know, if I can better understand and manage my emotions, um, I think a lot of times I'll feel like I have more autonomy and agency, right? So I feel like I'm more in control of myself, and I'm more understanding of how I'm feeling in the moment and how I'm going to interact with these other people, and so I feel more in charge. And when that happens, for me personally anyway, I'm feeling more confident. I have a, a more kind of realistic and authentic interaction with the people I'm interacting with. Okay, so again, from more of like a training perspective, let's say, I think some of this stuff has a lot of potential uh, if it goes well, right? And, and whether it's, think about like from a managerial perspective, you know, I come in the entrepreneurship realm, so people who own companies and have to be leaders of people and leaders of companies, um, salespeople, that kind of thing, right? Sometimes you have to be a lot more serious and, and a lot more, um, uh, a lot more serious. And other times, you know, you can be a lot friendlier and have a lighter, lighter kind of attitude. And knowing what those scenarios are, and knowing what kind of feelings or emotive 
uh, emotions are going to be more successful and help achieve the result a little, a little more effectively is a really powerful tool if we could get there or if we could develop some things that are going to help the people develop these skills. Okay? Uh, and the last thing I think is, is in some way, this is what I struggle with. I put this in, and I took it out, and I put it in, and I took it out. But maybe in some ways, it's almost complementing human judgment. So if I can understand how I'm feeling and how somebody else is feeling and I can strengthen that human interaction, I think it might be able to help with better decision making when it comes to, to human interaction. Right? Um, I think it can certainly help us maybe navigate some of these ethical dilemmas that we're going to encounter in, in the business world and we do every day. Right? Because again, the ethical dilemmas oftentimes are almost always involve people. And so if we can understand people and relate to people better, I think that offers us the opportunity to do a better job of navigating some of these emotional or ethical dilemmas. The crisis management one is, is kind of obvious to me, right? All hell breaks loose and there's chaos going on and people get really super stressed. And how can we help people to navigate that so it's not as emotional of a, of a process, but a little more rational of a thought process? Uh, and then in my world of, of sort of entrepreneurship and innovation, the ideas of creativity and innovation fascinate me. Um, and particularly when we start talking about this kind of stuff, right? And do these things have the ability to be creative? I would argue no, on their own. But do these things help me to develop my ability to be creative and to be innovative? I think sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Obviously, it depends on the use case and the particular technology and approach and all that kind of thing. I think at the end of the day, this could be a possible use for these things that could be very beneficial for individuals and for companies. And it creates this more effective, nuanced approach to address a lot of the emotional and social challenges that you, know, you all face in your daily lives now, you have for your life. Uh, but you're certainly going to face when you, you get older, when you take on more responsibility, when you have more power and influence in the jobs and the, the positions in your life that you have. And I think it's a really important thing to be able to acknowledge and to be able to de develop the skills to navigate these kind of challenges. And if there is some sort of technology that helps us improve that ability, I think that's a good thing. But I think it's really, really, really difficult to get there, if even possible. But it's kind of a cool thing to think about. So um, I just, I'll just i end with this uh, quote here from Ray. Um, and, and I like it. And, and I think in some ways it's applicable here, right? Because a lot of this stuff that we're, we're talking about here, it has to do with like where we're going. Right? And it has to do with the future. And oftentimes, the intuition we have where somebody says, that's a good thing or that's a bad thing, it's, it seems to be a very linear process. Right? But with a lot of this technology, it's a very exponential process. And so I think we have to look at it and say, it's here. It's not going anywhere. It's going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to, to discuss it, argue about it, whatever it might be. Right? Um, but we have to think about it so that we don't let it get too far ahead of us. I think is the ultimate thing. Um, like I said, I really got deep into this once uh, Bernard, Bernard had asked me to do this, and I started kind of stalking Frank and, and learning a lot about him. <laughs> and, um, and so I started putting up all these ideas and thoughts I had and everything, and then I thought, there's no way in hell you guys want to hear all that stuff. So I put it in a document. If you're interested in checking it out, uh, feel free. Thank you. Frank, so you talked about, your, you used the word gimmicky or gimmick. So um, I was interested to have you expand more on that. For me, the way I was looking at the diagram that you presented, it looked like kind of between the four points that you were making before you used that word, like the gimmick thing would kind of be like a bullseye in the middle. Um, and so the way that I read it is kind of like, if we were to put guardrails on it, um, then it would kind of turn into a gimmick, as in like if we really just kind of let it breathe and like try to make it as good as it possibly could be, then it would be, it would interrupt like the day to day because it would be so good. And then if you put the guardrails on it, then it's just gonna be like a gimmick, basically. That's the way that I was taking it. So I was just kind of hoping that you could, I guess, expand more on that. And I guess, how do we make it not so much a gimmick, more something like Dylan was talking about that we can leverage in an ethical manner um, and not so much like taking advantage of people. Great, great. No, I think that's a really good question. You know, it's a, no, I really appreciate that question. I, I appreciate the response because it is, I think that the, the, 
the first thing I would say is like, I think in the therapeutic context, and I, I did carve that out at the beginning of the talk, I think therapeutically, yeah, I'm, I'm totally up for this stuff, you know, and I think it, it would really help a lot of people in many ways. I do think that the question of, let me go to education first, and as an educator, the question of soft skills is a really interesting one, right? Because it's sort of like, it's one of those questions that the OECD has sort of really highlighted this idea that we need to have a lot of work in the future is gonna be collaborative. It's gonna be a lot of what Alison Pugh calls connective labor. It's sort of gonna be a lot of things that are, are done routinely are just gonna be done by machines. And so you've gotta be emotionally intelligent enough to connect different people as managers and as people coordinating things or as uh, designers, other you know, people working between these different types of fields. So I do see that as a way in which um, you can have people helped by these sort of computational analyses. I guess the way that I think, I, I would just say that a lot of the other work that I do is on data access and AI explainability. And I think that where I would want to see this go is toward ensuring that people have access to the profiles that are being created of themselves so that they can always tell part of the story. I think maybe part of the idea of this is that, you know, as a narrative, part of these things is that they're creating certain stories about people, certain narratives about people. And I think that the part of where I, I, I get suspicious of it is that if people don't have a chance to participate on their own. But if they do have that chance, then it opens, a lot to, opens the door to a lot more of the possibilities that Dylan was talking about. So yeah. Any thoughts yeah. I agree. Oh, <laughs> thanks. No, I do. I do. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you just say what you mean by calling AI, um, AI gimmicky? So just explain that, that part. The gimmick part, sure. I mean, I think that, you know, what's fascinating to me is that you can follow people on Twitter that are AI influencers, right, or on, on X now, you know, and, and they will give you story after story that says, look, this AI dermatologist outperforms dermatologists, okay? But then you, you scratch the surface of the story and it's like, oh, for this very specific type of melanoma with pre-labeled data sets, in this comparison, the AI is better at recognizing melanoma than a dermatologist, okay? So, and you're, by the way, you're all gonna face this in your jobs. Almost any job you do, you're gonna have some higher level manager that'll try to find a way to cut your job by saying we can replace that person with AI, right? I mean, I face this as a professor. I mean, certainly, you know, lots of ways where people sort of say this, but anybody has sort of said this, right? Maybe, maybe it's true about me, I don't know. But, but I think you're gonna face this. But then you scratch the surface and you find out that like a dermatologist's job is a lot more than recognizing that one melanoma of 5,000 skin conditions that they've learned to recognize in medical school. Secondly, let's imagine that you have the AI that recognizes all 5,000 skin conditions better than people do, which I think is very difficult given data, but you know, let's assume that could happen, right? Next step is, can the AI actually perform the biopsy of the mole to do that? Not likely, okay? So then you've gotta have even more technology to do that sort of thing. Third thing is, can that AI actually relate to the person, the treatment choices, when they've got that type of issue, okay? Why do I make, give that example of the dermatologist? Because I feel like there's a lot of AI hype that says AI is just on the cusp of knocking us all out, right? Of, of doing this job, that job, job, and, and indeed of, of, of being emotional, right? But I think on the failure sides, the failure modes that I had in my talk about both misrecognition and alienation, I expect those to be really persistent because of the problem uh, that I've just mentioned where it's really hard. It's hard, I mean, I, I can imagine, and I'd love to hear from anybody in the room that has dealt with replicas, uh, services, with shall I, with online sort of emo uh, efforts to try to like be emotional. But my sense is that, you know, there's almost like a, a pressure on people to say that it works, to sort of say, oh yeah, it does work and to sort of try to look through its gimmicky nature. But yeah, but I think, I think so, so I think that the problem that I have is, is maybe I could have ended better perhaps by emphasizing the hype part and just sort of saying watch out for the hype and sort of watch out for it as that. Because I, I don't want to give you the sense that like, oh, it's all just a big gimmick and it's all just a big shell game. There are some real advances being made in these fields. But I also think that like the gimmick of a lot of emotion recognition is that they're trying to call recognition what is really attribution. Okay, that'll get back to your question, right? Sorry, it sometimes takes me a long time to think my way back to the direct answer to the question, which is to say that 
the gimmick here is these companies are attributing emotion to people. Is it really their emotion? Did anybody ask? They probably not, right? So the gimmick is to sort of get you to think that they've actually seen what they're think what other people are thinking without actually asking them. That I think is the gimmick aspect of it. Yeah. Well I think you have to you have to look at that I think a lot of these things, you know, there's an agenda behind it. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think a lot of these it, it would seem to me, I, I make an assumption that people go into it with an agenda, and so they may be steering the things toward whatever agenda they're going for, right? So they look yeah. at it with this very narrow focus, and then that clouds the reality of the situation, and so we are not hearing the full situation, right? So we say, yes, it's great at that. Well, no, it's really not, because these people parsed out all these other pieces of the puzzle that would in ultimately say it's not really great at that. Right. So I think you yeah. gotta, you know, when you're when you're evaluating these things, I think you just gotta have that open mind. And for me, from a business standpoint, the businesses that are behind developing this stuff, they have an agenda and they need to show some success and some usage. And so also sometimes I think that can cloud a lot of what you're seeing here because if they continuously show that things are failing or not doing what they say they're doing, there's gonna be a problem. Right, business context. Yeah, oh, lots of, of hands. Uh, Bernard, would you like to choose among the? Because <laughs> I, I, I want to defer to you in terms of. Uh, yeah. Three hands. So I think it's four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah, and then I do see you two, Andy. So, Please, first row up there, and then second row, and then Andy. Okay. Um, reverse to your end or end slide. I want to ask, do you believe that quantity or the quality of human input is a neural network that can balance these five things? Excellent point. So to repeat the question, the question is, could we solve for the bias problem, right? And I think that's a really tough question. I think that it, I'll give you reasons for optimism and reasons for pessimism. Optimism would be that I think that, you know, if you were to look at different marginalized groups in society and say, let's make sure there is representation and also participation by the groups to sort of say, you know, and this particularly, I mean, we've learned a lot, I think, from the representation of women in medical data. For a long time, a lot of medical data was dominated by men. Um, and so it was good for men, but it necessarily, it often didn't have exact, it, it wasn't as, as, as clear and as clarified as for, for women. And so a lot of uh, medical centers have been trying to make sure that they add to existing databases to make sure that they've got some parity there, or at least they have sufficient representation of women in the database. And I think you could say the same for many marginalized groups. The question though becomes, when you start doing like the cross tabs or the intersectionality of the issue, then what happens, right? So you can say, well, you've got representation, for example, of, um, uh, you know, say, say people from a certain place or a certain for race or ethnicity, but do you have it for people of that race and ethnicity from New York or from the South or from California or from wherever, right? Because each of those could do it. And I think that's where it starts getting really tricky. Um, there's an area of law called personalized law that tries to do this sort of stuff, that tries to think about like, how would we give everybody a personalized speed limit on the highway? Imagine that, right? Imagine you were taking a test. This is another part of tech law that I love, right? Imagine that like you, during your driver's test, it's, imagine it was like the GRE and it just got harder and harder and harder. And then if you got like a perfect score, you get to drive 120 miles an hour, right? <laughs> this is sort of the dream of a lot of com computation is that you would do this. You would be able to say, and then other people that were just, just barely made it, you'd say, oh, they can only drive 30 miles an hour or whatever it would be, right? Or they need to have driver assist on all the time. Um, that sort of dream, I, I think is a little, I worry about it because I don't think you're ever going to really find the perfectly calibrated data set. But I know there's more questions. I, I can say more, but thanks so much. That's a great question. Yeah. I don't think, yeah. I don't think you can ever take bias out of it. Because you're dealing yeah. with humans and the brain, and there's just so much diversity and ambiguity and situational context that I think there's always going to be some bias in it. Yeah. It's by nature. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a question that probably almost everybody is thinking. Uh, what are your thoughts on the recent TikTok and being passed by the house? <laughs> Yes. Ah, oh, you're putting me on the spot. Oh, no. No, <laughs> so, no. no. I, I do think it's, I, I, I tend to look at it through the lens of trade. And my worry is that if we have a scenario where there's an asymmetry, where China does not allow Instagram and Facebook, 
Um, but we're supposed to allow social networks from everywhere, including China. I don't like that asymmetry, right? So I feel like if they were to say tomorrow, if Xi Jinping were to say, hey, you know what? Facebook, Instagram, let them on mainland China, right? We'd love to see it, right? Then I'd say, absolutely, no way there should be a TikTok ban. But given that problem, I'm kind of worried. Now, I know that the current debate is all about national security, right? And I mean, to that extent, I, I worry that these sort of national security debates can become a self-fulfilling prophecy because they can tend to sort of stoke uh, suspicion between different places and sort of, li 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 but, but I, I just sort of basically, my, my fundamental take on it is that because of that trade side, I just don't think it's fair. And so that's why I, I, would, uh, I, I would support it, so yeah. I Yeah, yeah. And I think, what, I mean, Facebook Reels has already tried to become, they, they've already tried to become TikTok, so no. <laughs> but I, so we'll see. But yes, yeah. Yes, oh, please. Yeah, and if I, I, I think that the, um, I would agree with that. And I, I think that the other question, and to, to relate it to the, the effective computing aspect, maybe what I would say is like, ultimately the business has a goal of having customers that return, making a profit, you know, et cetera. Maybe we just cut out the middle where we're trying to make people feel certain ways or detect how they feel. Maybe where we go is just to a realm of pure behaviorism. And to give a sense here, what I think is really interesting about the, the history of psychology is there's a, uh, there was a, a, a psychologist named B.F. Skinner in the 30s who developed this sort of behaviorist approach and essentially saw the mind as a black box. He was like saying, we don't know, we don't care what's going on in the mind. We just think about stimulus and response. You know, we, we have the classic example of like just having a, 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 a pigeon, you know, pecking at certain things in response to certain uh, stimuli. And I think I would almost be more comfortable with a, a business that sort of used AI without explaining, without trying to sort of uh, uh, get a certain emotional state out of people and just said, we want this action from people. We don't care what emotional state led to it, we just want the action, right? And so maybe that's where I feel the, the, the if I have, since I've given all these misgivings about um, corporations and governments trying to read and stimulate our emotional states, maybe what I want to do is just say, well, what do you want from us, right? As opposed to how do you want to make, how do you want us to feel? <laughs> so I think that would be my, my answer there, would be that maybe, and, and I know that that is sort of like shrinking the realm of affective computing but I think it opens up other fields for AI to figure out how to do the, do the service better, how to make things more efficiently, et cetera. So, yeah. 45%, no, just kidding. <laughs> no, no there's, there's a high level, yes. And just to, re to repeat the question, the question is, and the question is a very important question to always think about if you're critiquing AI, what's the benchmark, right? So if you say this is a discriminatory credit scoring system, AI credit system, you've got to say, well, what's the benchmark? Was it even more discriminatory? Right? or it did have other problems. So you do always have to have a benchmark. But I do think that these things are uniquely problematic in that they come with this sort of a patina of science. Right? It's sort of like when you have someone say, well, you know, we've run your face to the machine and it's like you're a 93% aggressive case or something. You know, that I sort of worry about, whereas like if, if it's a person saying that's an aggressive case, then and it, to a person, they get to sort of say, say it back and forth. So I think it's that maybe the, the, the key difference is the sort of scaling and lack of understanding of what's going on in the technology. So, yeah. I think it's a, yeah, I think it'd be a significant number. I mean, I think humans, it's the same sort of issues and sort of struggles and such. So I think it's just humans versus computers. And sometimes the computers can lessen it, sometimes they sort of accentuate it. Yeah. Thanks for staying to the end. Thank you both our speakers. <laughs>